Greetings, greetings, greetings. Welcome to So Much to Talk About. My name is Nabate Isles, and it's always a pleasure to share facts and viewpoints of the world of sports as well as interview intriguing individuals. Before I, interview, before I introduce this gentleman, I want to remind you all to check out past episodes of So Much to Talk About on my YouTube channel, which is N is a No, S is a Sam, I is an Indigo, and S I World. So you can hear past episodes and hear past interviews on the show. And also, as well, check out my podcast in which I interview retired athletes and also uh, iconic um, performing artists as well called Where They At. So you can get that podcast on, on wherever you listen to your podcast, Spotify, Amazon Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, etc. But I want to introduce, I want to get right to it to introduce this gentleman who's one of the preeminent sports writers in the nation. And he was a columnist for the Dallas Morning News for 16 years, as well as the Boston Globe, and uh, also wrote for AOL, um, AOL's Fan House and many other publications, print and online. He is a longtime panelist for the immensely popular ESPN show Around the Horn, which features the nation's elite sports writers and personalities. Now he is a sports columnist for the Washington Post and is a professor for the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, College Park. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce this gentleman, Mr. Kevin Blackstone, on So Much to Talk About. How are you, sir? I'm doing good, brother. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Oh, anytime, anytime. You've accomplished so much and you've really made an impact on journalism and also, you know, not just in your work, but also mentoring. So talk about how special that is to mentor young journalists, you know, that, that are coming up and, and giving them kind of like, let them know what to expect in this dog eat dog world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I don't even um, I don't even think of it as mentoring. Uh, mm -hmm. I've I've I guess I've been involved in a few mentoring programs, but um, it's just people I get to know as they come into the business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like like I remember one time um, uh, Mark Spears, who covers been covering the uh, NBA for good years. friend, good friend, yeah, yes, indeed. You know, and and. <laughs> And Mark was giving me credit for mentoring him. And I'm like, I'm like, I, I, I don't, I didn't even re recall doing that, but he was an, he was an intern at the Dallas morning news when, when I was a, a columnist in the sports section. So I got to know him there and, wow. you know, he reminded me, we went out to lunch or breakfast or something and talked over some issues. I have no clue, but you know, if people call me and they want advice or if I see people and I can um, imbue some of my, my uh, thoughts, um, things that I've picked up from my mentors over the years, uh, of which I've had many, um, mm. then, then I do that um, because I think it's, it's important. And now that I'm involved in ped pedagogy, you know, it's, uh, I, I have to really uh, be serious and, and, and systematic about it, right, mm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in teaching the, the journalists of tomorrow. And I think I've had, you know, some success in that, but I learn a lot from them as well. You know, because uh, this is a this is a generation that has come up in a media that I did not come up with, come up in. Mm -hmm. You know, it is native to them. Uh, it is new to me. Um, and they have different ideas about uh, sports and how to cover sports um, than, than I did and that I do. And so I, I learn a lot from uh, I learn as much from students as, as I hope they learn from me. Yes. And that's the art of, of teaching, you know, because that generational thing, you know, you learn what's what's going on, what's relevant, right. you know, and everything. And you can kind of take things with a grain of salt at the same time, you know, with how things are managed. And it's funny, I was going to ask you this later on the show, but it was a perfect segue mm -hmm. to your recent piece on Kwame Brown, you know, talking about the trolling that's going on right. with sports media and everything like that, especially with the emergence of social media throughout the past uh, 10 years or so. And it's funny there was a quote that you led your your column with mm -hmm. by umberto echo i pronounced his last name echo you correct know, like, who's a who's a a, a a a kind of like a someone that 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 talked about media and, and that's right and was a crit critique type of writer but he said this which is really interesting <laughs> about sports <laughs> talk a yeah. place of total ignorance it shapes the ideal citizen so profoundly that in extreme cases and there are many he refuses 
refuses to discuss this daily availability he has for empty discussion, talking about sports media. And that made me right. sit back and think. I remember you said in the piece, it made you sit back and think. But but kind of like the Kwame Brown situation, how his character was somewhat assassinated by a lot of Absolutely. different people. Even though he's had his struggles on the court, they didn't understand what the strife he went through to get there and exactly. everything. So please express how, how Kwame Brown is now a champion for the people and how he is ex exposing what Mr. Echo said basically 50 years earlier. <laughs> right. I mean, and how prescient is that, right? I mean, he mm -hmm. wrote that before, <laughs> way before <laughs> digital media. He yeah. wrote that even before uh, sports journalism had become this um, uh, sometime, sometimes uh, uh, critical cesspool mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the people we watch um, perform in sports. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Kwame Brown thing, and for people who don't know, you know, Kwame Brown was the number one draft pick in, in 2001 by the Washington Wizards. Um, and he was the first high schooler to be drafted number one mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the NBA. So much was expected of him. Uh, and it got off to a very um, rocky start for him. Um, he was, uh, he was um, bludgeoned by... Uh, uh, Michael Jordan yeah. uh, psychologically mm -hmm. uh, while he was here in, in D.C. during Jordan's last uh, few years. Um, and over time, he really became the butt of jokes. He mm -hmm. became the poster boy for the term bust, um, yeah. certainly within the um, NBA. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is um, I hadn't thought about Kwame Brown until this thing happened a few right. weeks ago. In fact, I'd never even, I had no recollection of even hearing Kwame Brown. You know, his voice. Uh, right, that's his true. His cadence. I, 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 no one ever really interviewed him that I, I recall. Mm -hmm. you know, I maybe mm -hmm. read something. I never, so um, uh, a friend of mine uh, called me one day and he, he said, hey, have you heard these Kwame Brown tapes? He's, <laughs> if you watch this YouTube thing. And I was like, no, nah, man, that's just, that's YouTube noise. I, I don't want to, he was like, you got to listen to it. So I did. And, you know, an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half later, I'm still listening. And yes. I was just mesmerized because after you um, sift through the profanity, um, he had nuggets of truth in his mm -hmm. critique of journalism in general but sports journalism in particular yes. and what it had done to him um, in assassination assassination of his character in order for someone to um, garner some clicks or some views on YouTube mm -hmm. and it made me sit back and, and and really analyze you know what it is we're, we're doing today and then what was most, you know, what maybe was most disturbing to me about the whole thing was that um, uh, Kwame Brown pointed out um, uh, uh, perfectly um, uh, that these were his brethren, his mm -hmm. black brethren in the NBA, specifically um, Gilbert Arenas, Stephen Jackson, <clears throat> um, and uh, Matt Barnes, mm -hmm. who were taking these shots at him, right? And and all know, three teammates, a, teammates of his, three yeah. teammates mm -hmm. of his. Mm -hmm. And I think he had the, I think he had a quote at some point where he said they were doing the white man's bidding, right? Yes. Which raises the question for me, and I don't see those three are not journalists, but they are, they have a media platform, which raises the question for me if, if you're doing the same thing that bothers black athletes about how the media critiques them, um, then what does that really say about what you're doing and, and, and what difference are you really making, mm -hmm. right? Um, what does that say about diversity in media? Um, it's, it's not a good commentary. Yes. Uh, and, um, uh, and, he, and he also, you know, he also critiqued um, Stephen, a. Jackson, uh, Stephen A. Smith, who mm -hmm. I've known for years right. um, mm -hmm. for doing the same thing. And unfortunately, in Stephen, Stephen A's case, he doubled down, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than sit back and do an analysis and kind of listen to what Kwame was saying, instead, he put together 
you know, uh, yeah. the a, highlight a role reel. of the oh, highlight the low, light, reel low of, lights, right? The low yeah. lights, right? Mm-hmm. And as Kwame and as Kwame Brown said, he said, I, "I've been in this league for tw- I was in this league for twelve years, for twelve years." Yes. Um, when you are when you are in the NBA for that long, or when you're in the NBA at all, you are considered one of the best. That's because you are one of the best basketball players on the planet Earth. That's right. Didn't have That's to go to big, Europe. Didn't exactly. have to go to Europe. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Didn't you know? And and maybe and maybe he could have to even extend his career, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you know, I also don't have any recollection of Kwame Brown really being in trouble um, or anything like that. And then. You know, the fact that he came from a free lunch program, um, you know, uh, mm-hmm. a single a single parent household where his mother was literally doing backbreaking work, cleaning hotels and motels um, to keep all her kids uh, fed and clothed as best she could. And for him to have success with his athletic career, um, I, yes. you know, I, I think. I think for those in media to not acknowledge that and instead dissect um, for one's own entertainment, the fact that he did not live up to the media's expectations of him. Right. Um, right. I, I just think that's wrong. I think it's damning. And I, and I'm glad that Kwame Brown said what he said. Yes. I'm, I'm very glad, you know, and, and, and he's not, and also it's like you, you, you awake a sleeping giant like he was sleeping for a long time yeah. and, and just right. living, living his, his life, life, you know, um, going about his business. And 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 just and, and when I saw that all the smoke, I was like, you know, I was like, OK, that it was too much right there. And then what Charlemagne right. the God from the Breakfast Club, what he when he went personal on Kwame's and, and made I'm glad Kwame pretty much. E, like quote unquote ethered him because right. to make Charlemagne right. make that apology, you know. That's right. Everything. That's right. You know, absolutely. But um, but uh, I'm glad for Kwame Brown to speak. And and it's funny, Russell Westbrook, Washington Wizards. You know where where you where you are uh, covering. Yeah. You know, Washington sports and and basically national sports, but through Washington, like. Russell Westbrook kind of prefaced that a couple weeks earlier, you know, talking Hmm. about I won in life, you know, and everything. what's your take on Westbrook's response, even though, you know, even though his the expectations for him are higher because he's been an all time great, you know, like, right. What's your what's your take on what Westbrook said? Well, I think, you know, I think Westbrook is 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 well thought out in in his response. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do think that we sometimes equate um, su- success for athletes within the athletic realm with success for them in life. I, I do think we, you know, we-, we equate the two. So if someone doesn't perform up to our expectations for our team, right, then we criticize them overall. You know, we don't we, we don't compartmentalize. Mm-hmm that is being their job um, to put food on the table for their family, um, as well as to live an extravagant lifestyle, if that's what they choose. Um, uh, from, you know, we don't, from their ability to, to be a champion in their sport. Um, and so, and so I, I understand that because we, we, so, we so often judge athletes um, uh, not as human beings, but just as these objects um, within yep. their game, right? Yep. And then we do the other weird thing. We demand, for whatever reasons, that when something happens in society that's uncomfortable, that they call it out. So it's like, yes. where, where, where do we want to, you know, where do we want to be on this? You know, why do, we, why do we seem to have this binary approach to our critique of those who play sports and perform in sports, so I, I so I kind of understand what um, what Russell Russell was saying, um, but they also often say that athletes will often also say that as a sort of shield, right, as a protection um, mm-hmm. to themselves, right? Oh yeah, I had a bad game, but um, I got a nice house, I got a great family, and I'm doing this other thing, and you're not paying attention to that. So I kind of, you know, I kind of under, I kind of understand that. 
I'm looking forward to Russell and Stanley Nelson's project on Black Wall Street. I'm mm. looking forward to that documentary for sure, you know, with Russell executive producing it. Uh, here with the great Kevin Blackstone on So Much to Talk About, one of the preeminent journalists, sports journalists in the entire nation, a veteran of, of great uh, commentary on society and sports for sure here on So Much to Talk About. My name is Nabatel. So Kevin, the NBA playoffs, it's, I mean, I have not seen the playoffs be this wide open in, I think, since probably 99, maybe, probably 1999 when the Bulls uh, joined in retirement. I think other than that, it has not been this wide open. I mean, what is your take on, like, which team will emerge to raise that Larry O'Brien trophy after the carnage (laughs) and the blood on the floor. (laughs) Well, and then that's, and that's a good point. So I'd say two things, you know, one of the reasons it's wide open is because the, the, the NBA is historically is dominated by its best players, right? It's generational Mm -hmm. players. So you mentioned Jordan. And of course, before that, you know, it was magic and um, it was magic and uh, Larry. Um, and now we have, you know, the, the end of the LeBron um, reign, right? And he's not in it because of injuries to the Lakers. Um, and they just won it a year ago in the bubble. Um, yep. And so now it's, that's why it's, it's wide open. And, um, you know, you, you, you prefaced it right there. I mean, the injuries, right? This is like, it's like marching across a rickety bridge. And whoever gets to the other side before that rickety bridge collapses into the ravine is going to be the winner. And yep. so right now, you know, who knows? It, it's hard to say for sure whether or not the injuries are related to the fact that um, the season started December 22nd when players wanted it to start on January 18th in order to get just another month's rest from, from the COVID season. Mm-hmm. Um, Obviously, the, the, you know, the games are pretty much the same number um, in, in terms of the time span, um, 72 games in 145 days this time. Uh, but it, it really has come down to health. And we, we saw the unfortunate injury to Kawhi, to Kawhi Leonard. Um, yeah. oh. uh, we've seen the, all the other injuries that have cropped up. No, injuries it's... happen all the time. I mean, mm-hmm. just ask Chris Paul when he was with, with the Rockets, right? <laughs> and then now with the COVID situation, how that's right. see p- people are now putting their guard down and look what happens. That's right. That's right. And so we'll, we'll have to find out like how that happened, you know, what, what it was that, that, that caused that. But um, yeah, I mean, I just think it's going to be, the, it's, it's literally going to be the last team standing, <laughs> you know, the last <laughs> team that has healthy legs that can stand up is going to win this thing. And it may not be the Sixers because as great as M- Embiid is, and has as heroically as he performed as an athlete last night, you know, knowing that he has torn, um, he has some, some torn tissue in his knee. Um, he's hobbled. He's hobbled. And it's not going to get any better the more he has to play on it. So, you know, right now, I think the, the, the Hawks have the upper hand uh, simply because they're healthy. So you think overall to win the whole thing? That's well, sir, well, well, out of the East, mm-hmm. you know, I, I would say out of the East. And when I and when I look in the West, um, even with Chris Paul's situation, he's going to come back. Yep. Right. And and, you know, and, and in a weird way, it might help him because he's got that shoulder um, that's getting better. So that's mm-hmm. a little bit more rest for it. So um, I think the Suns, you know, I, I'm looking at the Suns right now and I'm looking at. I'm looking at Atlanta. Um, you know, we'll see what the, you know, we'll, I, I like the Bucks coming in, but you can't trust Giannis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, so those, you know, those two teams. Disappointed in Giannis because you're defensive player of the year last year, two-time MVP. Um, you, you want, you know, you want to be recognized as an all time great and everything, which he is putting up the numbers, but I'm disappointed that he did not take the challenge to even tell his coach, I want Durant. I want to be on him. You, you know, that's mm-hmm. that. right. You got to do that. I mean, how many times have you seen LeBron pat his chest in the fourth quarter when somebody's going off 
I got this dude. That's right. One to five. Any of those positions. Any dude. <laughs> I got I got him. You know, um, so that's what you got to do. You got to have, you know, if Giannis had PJ Tucker in him, if he had that kind of personality, that you know, I, I think they'd be a lot better off. Um, but he does not he does not possess that that mentality right now. And um somebody needs to infuse that in him quickly if they are to realize their potential. Oh, wow. And, uh, and Kevin, real quick, Scott Brooks, he was let go. And, and he was, I, for, I hate using this term, a dead man walking. I can't stand what he's in that term, right, right. But, but it has a ring to it, though. But I don't, <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> right. but, right. but, but when you go into your last year and you don't have any years after that, you know that's what's going to happen. So it's a shame, but it's Scott Brooks is one of the nicest people ever. Yeah, you know, good dude. Sure. He's a, yeah, yeah he's a, he's a humor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, a, he's a good guy, and I've known him since he was a player, mm-hmm. and uh, we, we've gone out to dinner before. And yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there was no, there was no way he was going to uh, survive um, for the reasons that you just laid out. Um, you know, his high water mark here was his very first season when they won 49 games has been downhill since then. Yep. Um, uh, the John so Wall injury didn't help. That was the thing. That- John Wall injury that didn't help. Um, the blow up with the, with the ownership between John Wall with John Wall, that didn't help. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, he just didn't, he didn't have many breaks here. And then people look this year and they say, well, you've got, You've got the leading scorer in the league in Brad Beal, <laughs> and you got Mr. Triple Double in Russell Westbrook. The team should be better than it is. Um, but, you know, Westbrook had little struggles coming back this year from injury. Mm-hmm. Um, they had some new guys that were trying to weave in. Thomas Bryant got hurt early in the season, and he's a lunch pail guy, mm-hmm. a great glue guy for the team. Uh, so they, they had a number, of, a number of problems. And, you know, and it's, it's go- it goes beyond just the coach. I mean, it's the whole philosophical uh, approach of the, of the team and how they're going to build it. So um, we'll see. You know, we'll see. I'm, as I'm talking to you, my, my phone buzzed with a couple of text messages from a friend of mine in the NBA who's a coach uh-huh. um, suggesting to me about what might happen and who might be headed to D.C. So, you know, we'll see. That's what I want to ask now, I, you know, <laughs> on some names that you think, or if, if you don't want to mention names, the type of coach that they need to have and should they trade Westbrook? Okay. So here's, so here's my thing. So here's my thing. I would, if, if I'm Tommy Shepard and I've known Tommy Shepard since he was a sports information guy for Fresno state. All right. <laughs> Wow, was it um, during the Tark days? During the yeah, Jerry Tark yeah, days? Oh yeah, 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 way back. In the oh day. god, he with those cast of characters, up. those cast of oh, characters of that team. Well, that's Man. a whole nother show. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, uh, you know, I don't. There's, there's one way to build. Um, there's, there's really one tried and true way to build um, a championship competitive NBA team, and that's through the draft, right? The Nets. This is a weird thing that happened. Although you could argue that they did it with picks, right? Mm-hmm. So kind of, sort of. Um, but most teams, they grow, they, they build from within. And Brad Beal is, a, is the cornerstone from within. Mm-hmm. But I think at this point, you know, I don't know that Brad Beal's value will ever be greater. And I think sometimes you just have to close your eyes and pull the plug. Yeah. And I would try... If I were running the team, I would go into the owner, Ted Leonsis, and say, look, we need, we need a long-term plan. And <laughs> Blow it up. Brad, Blow it yep, up. and Brad Beal's, Brad Beal's role in that long-term plan is to produce as many first-round draft picks as we can get. That's right. Or young and, talent. Young talent. For young talent. Mm-hmm. And I would also do the same with Russell Westbrook. Mm-hmm. And I would also trade um, Bertans, the, the, the sharpshooter. Ooh. Um, even though they, oh, I, I, I would, I would destroy, you know, I would, I would start all over again. I mean, we laughed at what Philadelphia um, did. We, we, we laughed at that plan, right? Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, uh, trust Sam the Hankey. process. <laughs> right. And look what they did. I mean, they traded, um, they had the rookie of the year who they had drafted, um, Michael um, Carter oh, Williams. Michael Carter was right, right. They traded him. Mm-hmm. They traded him. Um, 
You know, was, they had was it trades. the same? Was it the right. same since? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and uh, you know, they made some trades that also didn't work out. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, they got a team that's at the cusp, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and you look at Atlanta. You know, they 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 got rid of people, and mm-hmm. now they got Trey Young. They got Collins. They got a nice young nucleus. Yes. Um, yeah. How beautiful. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, how yeah, beautiful no, no, no. was that trade? Doncic for Young and Hunter, basically. De- and DeAndre Hunter. People are saying, oh, Luka Doncic, but Trey Young is at that level too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> exciting, exciting to watch. And I would argue that, and the proof is in this, is in this season, that the, uh, the, the soup that that the Hawks have, have put together is tastier than what the Mavericks have put together, right? I mean, Doncic doesn't have the help around him. Yep. I mean, Porzingis is not what people thought he was going to be. He's a good mm-hmm. player, though. Um, but he, he doesn't have the nucleus around him that the Hawks have. And the Hawks are missing Hunter right now, right? <laughs> exactly. How much better would they be if DeAndre Hunter was still playing? <laughs> so, so that's what I would do. And now, I don't think that's going to happen because, you know, Tommy Shepard's, a couple years into his general managership and to get rid of um, a, the second leading score, first leading score, depending on how you want to look at it mm-hmm. in the league, um, who was a great guy, by the way, mm-hmm. um, it's kind of a hard, it's a kind of a hard thing to ask a general manager um, to, to do. So mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, and he did just trade to get, you know, to get Westbrook. Yep. Um, so, I understand that, but I just don't know how much more you can get out of these two together. And, and, you know, I'm now I'm going to take off my, my journalism hat, right. And put on my Washington bullets hat. Just point <laughs> bullets, out, that's right. Yeah. That's, you know, I, you know, I remember when they won the championship here, that's a long Ooh, time ago. 78. That's yes. 78. Sir. That's a <laughs> long time ago. I was in college, dog. I was in college. Wow. Hey, guess what? But I'm a Knicks fan and I have never seen them win a championship in and my lifetime. So I, <laughs> I get so, you know, I mean, so I'm like, I'm like enough of this. I don't, I can, you know, I can wait a few more years if you can build it the right way. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and I'll just mention to you one name that um, is popular around here. Um, and that's David Vander, Vanderpool. Okay. Um, he was the assistant. He was the uh, assistant head coach uh, with Minnesota, who just got let go, who got mm-hmm. passed over when they hired uh, Chris Finch away mm-hmm. from the Raptors. Mm-hmm. And he's popular not only because he's an up and coming, um, solid head coach, but he's also from here. He yeah, played at cool. Blair High School, which is right around the corner wow. from me. Um, and then he went up to St. Bonaventure and played up there, and then he played mm-hmm. overseas. But mm-hmm. he's a local guy, and mm-hmm. so. Um, you know, that's a, that's a really popular name. Wow. No doubt. That now be good. They need to start from scratch for sure. Wow. But uh, here with, so. yes, sir. Wow. Here with the great Kevin Blackstone, one of the uh, top sports writers in the entire nation. And also we're going to get into some other topics as well, but, but what's really fascinating, uh, Kevin, is that you covered Nelson Mandela's, um, U.S. tour in 1990 and for the Dallas Morning News at that time and uh, now please like wow like I know you could talk about that experience for hours I'm sure you know Um, but how was your direct communication with Mr. Mandela and express you know how the experience left a lasting mark on you? Sure well that was um I was uh, covering economics at the time for the Dallas Morning News, Mm -hmm. and uh, I got tapped to um, uh, split the coverage with uh, one of my best friends, Kevin Merida, who at the time was um, a national political writer for the Dallas Morning News before he moved on to be undefeated. undefeated (laughs) Yes, sir. And now he's leaving undefeated to be uh, executive editor of the LA Times. Oh, wow. Okay. Please give Kevin my regards. Yes, right. When I last saw you, you, it was you and Kevin together at the the, the Verizon Center. Mm -hmm. That's that's right. That's right. That's my my man. Mm -hmm. And um, so I didn't have any direct, you know, you know, when, when Mandela got here, I mean, he was just, you know, it was one city after another city every, every day. Um, and there were just, uh, there was just a mad crush of humanity coming out to see him and you couldn't get, 
you know, you couldn't get close to him. Maybe some of the TV networks got to sit down with him. I don't, I don't recall, but you know, I was just there to chronicle the, um, the feelings of, of a nation um, embracing this man who, uh, you know, we have this, this, this phrase these days, which has just been trampled to death called athlete a- activism. Like I've heard that enough, like we should all activists. I don't care what your job is. Right. Um, right. But here's a guy who, who, you know, was an amateur boxer. Yes. Right. And you talk about the fight that he fought. Um, <laughs> now that that's a fight yes. um, that, you know, I mean, this man put his life on the line, uh, 27 years in prison at Robin Island um, off the coast of, uh, of Cape Town. And uh, solitary confinement most of that time, too. Most of that time, solitary confinement. Mm. And and I'll tell you, fast forward from from 1992 during that tour, um, or 19, 1990, 1990. In fact, I've got the 1994 um, presidential ballot uh, from South Africa right here on my wall. but uh, when I saw when the when I saw that the uh, that South Africa was rewarded with awarded the uh, World Cup um, for 2010, I circled that on my on my calendar. I said I got to go to that that particular World Cup. I just mm-hmm. want to see you know South <laughs> Africa, Mandela, the whole thing. And I did that. And to your point about solitary confinement, I happen to have um, a, one of my best friends is a documentary filmmaker. Hmm. who worked on a film about an acapella group that was born in Robben Island. Um, Hmm. And uh, so he, you know, he introduced me to them before I got there. When I got there, I hooked up with one of the guys and spent a a couple days with him um, in Cape Town as well as in on Robben Island. Um, and I did the whole tour and I went to, you know, Mandela's, um, cell, you know, um, where, and another sports connection, you look out the back of his cell through the bars Mm -hmm. and there's a field out there and it's a soccer pitch. And, um, it, it proved to be a important part of the liberation struggle in South Africa because the prisoners, most of whom were black, um, if not all, um, they they preyed on the sports fanaticism of the white guards, mm-hmm. um, and slowly but surely got the white guards to smuggle out messages back to their compadres in in uh, on the mainland. Mm-hmm. So. Um, you know, it was it was interesting seeing seeing all that. So, I mean, you know, Mandela is one of you know he's one of my one of my heroes who has been um, who has kind of been I would say reshaped by those of us in the media mm-hmm. into a more palpable human being. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, people like the, you know, the, the Mandela that we saw come out in the ni- in, in 1990 was this avuncular character. Right. Yeah. Um, smiling, waving. Um, uh, someone who was very calm, had a very calm demeanor. Mm-hmm. And what we in the media, for whatever reasons, refused to remind the public of is that this was a man who was in prison, solitary confinement, 27 years, because he had reached, he had, he had reached the boiling point with yes. trying to liberate his people. Um, and that meant picking up arms. That meant trying to, literally trying to blow up the infrastructure of South Africa, mm-hmm. which had its, its boot on the throat of indigenous black people in in Azania. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know we don't it, that's one of the things we do in in the media when we we frame things um, to make it more palatable, to make people more comfortable about the information, right? Mm. I mean the 
the Jackie, I always say this, the Jackie Robinson that we celebrate in this country oh. is the Jackie Robinson who turned the other cheek, um, took all the abuse mm -hmm. um, in order to play baseball, um, in order to help Major League Baseball make money during a very down period mm -hmm. um, and let in some other black stars. The Jackie Robinson we don't celebrate is a Jackie Robinson who in his retirement wrote in his autobi autobiography that he could, he could no longer, that because of the way he had been treated as a black man in this country, he could no longer stand for the national anthem. We don't celebrate uh -huh. that Jackie Robinson. Yep. And we don't celebrate the Jackie Robinson who before he became a major league baseball player was court-martialed in the army for refusing to give up his, to refuse to relinquish his seat under the orders of a white officer who basically gave him the move to the back of the bus um, order, right? Mm -hmm. Again, we don't celebrate that. Yes. Because that's a militant Jackie Robinson, mm -hmm. right? So we don't celebrate militancy for black people in this, in this country. Yes. Um, uh, and, and so that's what I think about oftentimes when I think about um, Nelson Mandela. You know, we, we celebrate the avuncular Nel Nelson Mandela after he's out of prison. Mm -hmm. after he's an aged man yep. you know we don't celebrate um we don't we don't celebrate the um the the guerrilla warrior um that he had 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 he had to become um mm -hmm. in south africa in order to liberate his people Wow, that's deep. And, and, and that segues to what I want to talk with you about. Um, wow, here with the great Kevin Blackstone here on So Much to Talk About, one of the preeminent sports writers in the nation and uh, someone that, that has really um, done, done wonderful things and really revolutionized sports journalism with his words and how he delivers uh, the topic, you know, for sure, <laughs> um, on, here on So Much to Talk About. Now, Kevin, jazz the art form of jazz that you and oh, I love, you know, love I'm, it, man. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to be a part of it and, and, and blessed to have listeners and blessed to have historians and people like you that really appreciate the true essence of it, you know, love it, man. For sure. Yes. Sir. You know, and that's that black intellectualism. That's what it's about. The music, you know, from, right. from, from the emotions, from the strife that, and, and we don't celebrate, the Miles Davises, like what they went through, the Charlie Parkers, the right. Annette Coleman's, like f fighting for what they believed in, you know, like the Nina Simone's, like oh we, my goodness. we don't celebrate everything they've gone through. So, so Kevin, talk about that segue into jazz about how, you know, how it's it's kind of like the you know the true reasons why this art form isn't really pushed because it it, it expresses that that intellectualism, right? Like that's now right. What's you know, going on. Yeah, and you know, you know the, the the history of the music, you know, better than than I do. But you know, there was a time when jazz was the quote unquote popular music in this country, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and that was when people were dancing to it. That's when it was in that's right large clubs, right? Mm -hmm. Big bands. Mm -hmm. um, it was a show. It was like it a, was a, a show. show to it. Yes, absolutely. It was a show. It was it was theater, and then, you know, bebop moved it into smaller venues mm -hmm. and the cats who started bebop started challenging our notions about music and what it could do mm -hmm. you know and virtuosity mm -hmm. yeah virtuosity man mm -hmm. virtuosity mm -hmm. improvisation breaking for the from the norm and creating your own your own sound your mm -hmm. own voice that's right you know when 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 kendrick lamar um won the um Pulitzer won right. the Pulitzer. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was like, "That's that's great and, and good for him." Mm -hmm. But you know, I immediately thought back to Max Roach <laughs> and what he was doing in the fifties and sixties with right. with Abby Lincoln and how they oh. were challenging. You know, the Freedom you know, Songs, all Freedom, Freedom songs. Suite, the Freedom Suite, Freedom Suite. Mm -hmm. Suite. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, that was revolutionary stuff. Yes. You know, and so I've always been, you know. Um, I've become attracted to jazz over the years. I mean, I grew up with it in the household. My, you know, my, my father and all his friends played it. Mm -hmm. um, and Duke uh, Ellington, you grew up in the city with Duke Ellington. I grew up, easy. yeah, my, my father <laughs> knew Duke Ellington. Wow. So my father grew up, my father grew up in Leedroy Park, which oh is, and went to Dunbar. Goodness. And Duke oh. Ellington, I mean, Duke Ellington was older, but um, 
but yeah, he knew he knew oh, Duke Ellington from from Lee Droid Park. Ooh. There was also a trumpet player from Lee Droid Park. Oh, um, a big band guy, and now I can't I can't think of his name. Rex but Stewart, I, I, Rex Stewart, or no, no, I wasn't. Think who's from DC? No. Okay, it's uh, a trumpet player from way from back in the like thirties. Okay. I'll look it up for you because okay. you are you know you are in that in that lineage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and um, so. So yeah, so I've you know I've always been attracted to the music for uh, you know for a lot of those those reasons. Um, it, it you know I think jazz is an intellectual music, um, and but that doesn't mean that it's not um, digestible, it's not approachable, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it's a it's a it, it, it's a it's a music that I think is really um, reflective of our struggle um, yes. because of because of the improvisation. Um, because of how you as great musicians have twisted it and turned it and given it voice and made people think, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I just think it's, you know, I just think it's, it's incredible. I can't, you know, I never get, I never get enough of it. You know, wow. I love listening to the music, you mm -hmm. know, and trumpet players have been part of that cry, man. I mean, you know, you think about you think about Louis, you think about um, uh, Clifford Brown, yes, uh, one yes. of my favorites who doesn't get talked enough about and because he, his life was cut short, um, mm -hmm. Booker Little. Oh my goodness. Love yes. Booker Little. Classical you know? back, oh, that he, I grew up, that's one of my favorite players. There you go. 23 years old, he 23, passed. yeah, wow. yeah. I mean, just uh, that group that he had when he, he was with uh, Eric Dolphy. Um, out front. Uh, yep. Oh, yeah, my goodness. Oh, yes. Great yes. music. Great mm -hmm. music. So. Um, so, yeah, you know, I love listening to um, I, I, I get a sense of freedom from that um, from, from from that music. And I know you do a lot of um, spoken word, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yes. I do. And, with, I have spoken word artists I work with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it made me think about, you know, Wallace Ronnie. The late great Wallace, Wallace Roney went to Howard University. Mm -hmm. Went to Howard, yep. which is where he met who would be his wife, Jerry Allen. Ah, yes, yes. Well, they were on a um, they were in a band. They were in, a, in an ensemble called the um, African, I think it was the African Liberation Ensemble mm -hmm. at Howard University, mm -hmm. and they did it. Did two albums um, done by Haki Madubuti, the the poet. Ooh. And it's incredible spoken word over, you know, some complex rhythms, you know, African rhythms, you know, the, the, the jazz uh, tones that are, are brought into it. Mm -hmm. um, it's great. I mean, mm -hmm. it's two, two great um, LPs that they did, but it's... I have to check that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's liberation music, man. You yes. Know? You know, so um, yeah, I think about Wallace on that. Uh, on that is a very obviously a very young dude. I mean, he's in college. <laughs> yeah, God rest both their souls. You yeah, know? Um, yeah. And, and I just saw Antoine Roney uh, the other day. He performed. Oh. You know, Antoine's like Wallace and Antoine have been. They were so so good to me, you know, and and oh. so like you know really helped. Like they were they were mentors to me basically, you know, there especially you Wallace, you know, since I was in high school and everything. So, wow, yeah, you yeah. you're getting it from so, the from the man. <laughs> yes, sir. I mean a man who was bequeathed a a, a horn from Miles Davis. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> My <laughs> God, this is so. How powerful is that? That that is like that lineage once again. Like it's just so amazing, you know. And and um and while and pop speaking of Louis Armstrong, because we talk about Jackie Robinson, and people don't realize what Louis Armstrong. Oh my went goodness! Through, and and he's the fiftieth um fifty years in next month, July sixth, when pops passed wow. away. Can you believe that fifty years he's been gone? You know that that's um, incredible. And you know, you know, for people that don't know, who just they may see a video clip, you right. know, an old newsreel of. They have no idea of the of the battle this man fought. Yes, no idea. I mean, he was front line. He was a front line civil rights warrior. Mm -hmm. you know, don't let that don't let that smile fool you. Yep, and Miles right? realized it when Miles begrudged 
Louis Armstrong about that. Miles said he regretted it because then he realized he learned, yep. you know? Yep, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Important, um, yeah, important lesson around his life. So, yeah, and I'm just, you know, and I'm just, uh, uh, you know, we, we lost Wallace during this, um, during this <laughs> pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we lost some other great musicians during this time, just like yes. we did people in all walks. And I'm just, um, uh, you know, I'm happy for those who have survived, who will revive the music. Um, and as I mentioned to you, you know, I'm going to my first uh, uh, concert, my first show. That's right. Sunday. And I'm, yes. and I'm just looking so, so forward to it because I just love live music, man. Mm-hmm. Nothing mm-hmm. like live music, live theater. Yes, indeed. My good friends, Mary Havison, uh, Tom oh. Fujiwara, and, 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 and Taylor Ho Bynum, who I... Yep. Well, yeah, we just had a Zoom call together for the Festival of You're New Trumpet me. Music like a couple oh. of months ago. Taylor, we go way, but yeah, we go way wow. the same age. We're around the same age. Yeah, so. Wow, that's definitely. tremendous. You guys yeah. got a tight, uh, a tight knit um, community, community, man. That's what it is. You know, that's, it, it really is like that. And it's the same with media, like that yeah. tight knit community where, you know, and there are people that, that you gravitate to that you're friends for life. You know, right. they're exactly. those people that, the energy you want in your life, you want those people in your life, you know, but then there's others that you're like, okay, right. Cool, I'll right. work with you, but that's it. You right. Know? Like, right. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, yeah. and Kevin Merritt and I, we, we mentioned oh, earlier, you yes. know, he and I are big music fans. So we go to, yes, indeed. you know, I, I've been going to Newport for 20 some years. And, you going this, this August? You going this August? I can't, we couldn't, we couldn't, you know, it, it, it took a while for Newport to figure out how they were going to do everything. So we mm-hmm. this we're going to miss it this year again. But I'm 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 certain to be back um, to be back next year. You know, yes. are you going? Uh, no, I won't be able to. I won't be able to. But um, but yeah, but but definitely, I'm I'm looking because that's the thing with Newport. It like I played with Christian there a couple right. of times. It was just right, my man. Awesome, yeah. And now I'm trying to get my my to my point where I'm leading a group there. You there know you go. I mean? Of course, so, you know, definitely eventually that will happen. I'm just just pushing, you know. Well, congratulations so, on you know on your uh, your individual efforts. Oh, thank you. So I think sir. your first one was the one in 2018. 2018, yes, sir. Collective yeah. excursions. Yeah, that your, yep. That your, yep, yep, yep. So that was that's really cool. I love <laughs> the whole laid. I love the laid back thing. Oh, thank you. Well, you know? I mean, one that's... of the great MCs. Oh, what a tremendous MC. Very underrated. Detroit, Detroit mm. guy. Which, oh, really? You, as know we know, that. Detroit has that rich history of music. You know, oh, yeah. You know, Baker's so. Keyboard Lounge at 18th and Livernois. That's my that's my club in Detroit. Yes, so, yes. so that's the thing, man. See, this whole sports thing is really. It's just a vehicle for me to go places and find the music. <laughs> that's all, that's all yes. I do. I yes. go and I, you know, and I, and no matter where I go, I'm seek. I will seek out. Okay, who's in town, and and, and where are they at? Mm-hmm. And then I and I go and um, you know, and I go and check them out, and it never fails. Of course, New York is easy, right? Oh, New yes. York is easy. Yes, indeed. but then you get to other places like you know. I, I was in. I remember I was in. Um, I was in Minneapolis covering mm-hmm. something. And mm-hmm. so uh, I saw there was a there was a club in some hotel. Right. I go to this club to see whoever was playing. I forget who it was. It's somebody of note. At any uh-huh. rate, I get up and I go to the to the men's room during the break, and a guy comes in there, and he's got on a captain's hat. I look at the guy. Wait a second. That looks familiar. So I kind of wash my hands a little bit longer at the sink waiting for me to come <laughs> That's over. Right. Yeah. And I turned to him and I said, um, excuse me, you you look like uh, Jack McDuff. And he's like, he's like, I am Jack McDuff. <laughs> I was like, oh, are you wow. playing tonight? He said, no, I'm not playing tonight. He said, but I live here. He, he lived does. in Minneapolis. Wow. Yeah. So he was mm-hmm. out just watching whoever was playing. Um, That's, wow. But I got stories like that from like every city, man. Yes. There's no city where I do not where I do not wind up finding the music. No, oh, no question about that. No question. And and I, I, whoo, it's it's a beautiful thing, you know. And um, yeah. and just be, ble- I'm just so blessed with it. And 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 keep keep an eye out. I'm gonna keep you posted and keep the audience posted too on my new album. I just signed with Rope Adult Records. So nice. Yeah, so. Is that the, out of Philly? Uh, they're out of. Uh, yes, they're out of Philly. Yes, out of Philly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 They got Rope the Adult. whole music thing. They got the clothing line. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. 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 Absolutely. That's cool. Congratulations. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you so okay. much. So, you know, like, yeah, I'll definitely keep you posted. But also we, we 
Got to keep talking about the music and, and let me know how that show goes on Sunday for sure. Oh, buddy, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I, yeah, I'm man. I'm looking so uh, forward to it. Looking yeah, so too. forward to it. Well, yeah, I've not, as I mentioned to you, I think I've not seen uh, Halverson outside of her octet, or I think mm-hmm. she even has a bigger band than an octet. Right. That's right. That's um, right. And then yeah. her group, Cold Girl, is the small group, you know. Yeah, Cold yeah, Girl, yeah. Is, yeah. And, and I knew she did trio work, but this will be the first time I've actually seen her. Or trio work, and I've seen Fujiara before. Yes. I've, seen, I've seen the trumpet player before, and separate. You know, so this is going to be great. Yeah, it's going to no, be great. Woo, and I love that you listen to the all the scopes of the music. You know what love I mean? It. That's beautiful thing. It's like it's not set on like, and that's that's and that's the thing with the. I think what we need to, need to do in the jazz community, the musicians need to be more inclusive within the styles because that's what mm. makes this music beautiful, and that's why it makes this music a spectrum. That's what right. it's all exactly. about, you know. Exactly, sure. and that's and that, one of the great things about Newport. Um, I know when I first used to go to Newport, like back in the '90s or whatever, um, uh, it was, it was. I wouldn't say it was rigid, but uh-huh. the frame wasn't as wide as it is now. Yes, you know what I mean. And yes. now you go, and man, you got, you got everybody doing all sorts of things there. I mean, you yeah. got the New York, the downtown New York scene folk mm-hmm. are there. You know, you got a <laughs> R&B a, scene. The now R&B, R&B folk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you got that. You got, I was, one year I was there and it must have been like, it was like the octogenarian party because it was, um, <laughs> Brubeck was there. Wow. And he was, you know, in his 80s. Um, Sonny Rollins was there and he was in his 80s. Ooh. And it may have been, may have been, they may have had, Tony Bennett sang that year. Oh, yeah. Who's now in his mid 90s. Mid 90s. Yeah. Well, last the last the last Newport um, before COVID, um, they had the uh, Sun Ra Orchestra there. Oh, and Marshall Allen. Marshall, Marshall Allen, Allen was like 90. He was like 95 or something. And he, he looks was- younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just oh, he was killing it, man. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I love Newport. Love Newport. Wow, no. Doubt. And I know, and I know you're an NBA guy, so there. Mm-hmm. So one of the people I would bump into from time to time back in the day at Newport was Marty Blake. And oh, Marty Blake was the scouting, NBA the great scout. scouting guy. Yeah, exactly. He'd be out there. I was like Marty. Yeah. See, that's yeah. see, we have all all these great great people. See, it, it jazz and basketball it has that merge. It definitely yeah, does. You know, it does. Why do you young, think, do you have a reason for that? Do you have a theory? Oh, a rhythm, a rhythm okay. to it. Having an ensemble, it's all about being you know being really aware of where each player is at. As mm. when you're jazz, you're aware on what they're doing rhythmically, aware of what they're doing like stylistically. And then you adjust to that. And same with basketball. You have to adjust to certain mm. skill sets to the other four players on the court, just like you do for the That's other ensemble members, you know, especially when you're doing like improv- free improvisation, right. stuff like that, you know? Oh, that's a great, that's a great uh, uh, analogy there. I like yes. that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remember that. Yes, I'm sir. I'm definitely remember that. No doubt. Man, you should write, I, I think you should write a, a book on that. You basketball know, I think, and jazz. I think, I think I think a book is due. I think you do for that. I think you do for that because I think you would have the credibility to do it and okay. the knowledge to do it for sure. Okay, you know, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have to talk to my man Bill Roden about that because you know he's another, oh, yes, big, indeed. another big jazz man. Absolutely. You know? Oh wow. Did you know he used to be um, Billy Harper's manager? Yes, he. Yes, that's right. That's right. He was. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. You know, it is. I was like, man. Oh, but yeah. um. Well, wow, but Mr. Kevin Blackstone, wow, we could talk forever and ever for sure. Absolutely. But wow, but it's such an honor and a privilege to have you on. So much to talk about. I thank you for your time and thank you for what you do for wow. the sports industry and, and for, for, for the society in general. Thank oh, you so man, much. Oh, man, thank you for that praise. Thank you for that praise. Keep making your music. Thank keep you. Doing your, keep doing your sports. I, 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 love, I love that you've woven the two together, you and Christian. Wow. You guys are... Yes, <laughs> you guys indeed. are something else. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you put me in the category with Christian. I'm honored. I'm honored. You played with him. You played with him. You all are in the. You all are, are right there. Come on. Come on. Well, but well, thank you so much, Kevin, and, and thank you all for watching. So much to talk about. See you all next week. Have a wonderful uh, night. God bless and stay woke, everybody, and treat each other with respect and kindness. God bless. Bye bye. Peace. Thank you.